Nope, I'm not connected. Hold on. Today, <laughs> let me start talking. Today we're going to talk about Hannah Moore. How many of you have heard of Hannah Moore before? Don't talk, Megan. <laughs> Nobody else. You're in for a real, oh, you guys are in for a real treat. She is pretty fantastic. Um, a few years, oh no, I think a year ago, I did a study, Seven Women, by Eric Metaxas, and I found all the women to be very interesting and inspiring, but I found Hannah Moore to be the most interesting and fascinating, and, um, and so I'm going to talk about her today and her story. So I am a big fan of reading, um, and I love to learn that Hannah Moore wrote many things that helped shape the culture, um, but she was so much more than an author. She was also a teacher, a school founder, and an abolitionist. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Hannah Moore was born February 2nd, 1745 in Bristol, England. As a child, she had a remarkable memory. She had quick wit, a sharp tongue, and a thirst after knowledge. Her mother started to teach her to read at the age of four, but realized she already knew how to read. She was learning from her sisters who were older than her and she kind of taught herself how to read. Um, in 1758, Hannah's three older sisters started the School for Young Ladies by Mary Moran Sisters in Bristol. And when she was 16, Hannah started teaching there. Um, one of their students was the daughter of London actor William Powell, who had a tie to the Theater Royale, um, and their school had many outings there. It was located along Drury Lane and opened in 1663. It burned to the ground in Wait, it burned to the ground and was rebuilt in 1674. And this particular Theater Royale, because there are many, I don't know if you knew that, but there are a ton in England, um, this one became the largest and grandest stage yet. Um, so the School for Young Ladies by Mary Moran Sisters was very successful, which had a lot to do with the sisters' entrepreneurial spirit, but also due to the thriving economy in Bristol due to the slave trade. From 1698 to 1807, more than 2,000 slave ships set out from Bristol. So let's talk about Hannah's personal life. She was 22 years old when she met Will Turner, um, which is not the Will Turner from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> um, that's what I thought of. A cousin of two of her students is Will Turner, and he was 20 years her senior. They courted for six years. Um, Turner postponed the wedding three times, and there isn't a whole lot known why. So Hannah was tired of Bristol, and she was tired of William Turner, so she broke it off with him and went to Weston Super Mare, and there she met Dr. James Langhorn. He was a poet and a vicar, and he had already lost two wives in childbirth. So he proposed to Hannah, and she declined. <laughs> so she returned to Bristol in 1773, and Will Turner wanted her to give him one more chance at the altar, and she said no. So he offered her an annuity um, to pursue her literary vocation, 200 pounds a year, and she said yes. So she got 200 pounds a year and didn't get married. So um, <laughs> it is interesting to note that neither, she had five sisters, neither Hannah nor any of her sisters ever married, which is very interesting. In those days, marriage was focal, right? So I even thought of the opening line of Pride and Prejudice, which is, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And that just focuses on what was important in the day. And these days too, if you think about it, right? Um, marriage raised a lady above her station and ensured her future. So Hannah remaining single shows her tenacity, her boldness, and her independence. So with help from the annuity, this is where Hannah becomes a playwright. At this time, she had a family friend, James Stonehouse, who helped launch her literary career. Upon Hannah's return to Bristol in 1773, she published her first play, The Search After Happiness, and by the 1730s, it sold 10,000 copies. In 1774, she went to London to visit the Theatre Royale and hoped to meet its manager, David Garrick, but she didn't get the chance. Her next visit to London, she did get to see Eric, David Garrick perform. She wrote to her friend Stonehouse and told him about Garrick's talents. And Stonehouse was a personal friend of David Garrick, so he forwarded the letter to her. And because of this, Hannah got an invitation to David Garrick's house. And through him, she gained the friendships of London's greatest names in intellect and taste. 
So Hannah became a famous playwright. Her play Percy was performed for 22 nights and produced in theaters across England, France, and Austria. Her last play, The Fatal Falsehood, was received well, but on the second night of the performance, another playwright stood up and claimed plagiarism. And that was the last work for the stage. I couldn't really find out if it was true or not. I mean, she claims not, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, to, to Hannah, London was losing its luster and so was the theater. So in 1785, she moved to a cottage in Cowslip Green and her thoughts turned from literary acclaim towards service to God and other people. So this is the part where we go to Hannah's role in the abolition of slavery in England. There are two men who are very important in Hannah's life during this period. So if I say the abolition of England, any names pop to your head? Wilberforce. Yeah, Wilberforce and John Newton. <clears throat> Have you seen the movie Amazing Grace? Anybody? Yeah? Um, if not, it's a great movie. You should watch it. It's about William, Force, William Wilberforce's lifelong work as an abolitionist. And maybe you knew that Hannah Moore had a very minor role to play in the movie. She had like two lines in the whole thing. Um, but we'll soon find out, however, how big a role she actually had to play in the abolition. So I'll give a very, very brief background of Newton and Wilberforce to help understand what was going on during this time in the abolition. So John Newton wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, but before that he was a slave trader off the coast of Guinea and the West Indies. Even after becoming a Christian, he became a captain of a slave ship. But he gradually left this terrible business and he pursued priesthood. The person most known for spearheading the legal effort against the British slave trade is William Wilberforce. John Newton was his spiritual advisor and pastor of his church. In 1780, Wilberforce entered the House of Commons, which is Parliament, right? Um, he was a sponsor in anti-slavery legislation. In 1789, he introduced 12 resolutions against the slave trade and gave the most eloquent speeches, but they failed to be enacted into law. He carried on a 15-year journey to help end slavery, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But I thought it would be helpful to watch a clip from Amazing Grace about John Newton and William Wilberforce. <laughs> if it goes seamlessly. This is my confession. You must use it. Stand. Ship's records. Ports. People. Everything I remember is in here. And all my memories fading. <coughs> I'm going to choose things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. You must publish it. Throw a hole in that boat with it. Damn them with it! I wish I could remember all their names. My 20,000 ghosts. They all have names. Beautiful African names. We call them with just grunts. Night. We were apes. They were humans. <laughs> Everything. I couldn't breathe till I was this. I once was blind, but now I see. Did I write that too? Yes, you did. Well, now at last it's true. Now go, where are we? We're not so black to you, you and I. It's a good movie. <laughs> John, Bruton, John Newton wrote a book called Cardiphonia, or The Utterance of the Heart. It was a series of devotional letters which changed Hannah Moore's life. 
In 1787, she went to Newton's church, St. Mary Woolnoth, and they talked together for an hour. It was John Newton, his writings, his sermons, and friendship who convinced Hannah Moore to devote her life to promoting spiritual education and reformation. In 1787, Hannah met William Wilberforce. Afterwards, she said, that young man's character is one of the most extraordinary I have ever known for the talent, virtue, and piety. It is difficult not to grow better and wiser every time one converses with him. William Wilberforce becomes one of Hannah's dearest friends. Um, their friendship lasted 47 years, and they died within weeks of each other. William Wilberforce helped Hannah become passionate about the abolition of slavery. The Moore sisters hosted informal meetings of the abolitionists in their residence in Bristol. To help with the cause, um, Hannah Moore carried around a famous drawing of a slave ship and its human cargo to show people what was really going on in the slave trade. It's hard to imagine how information got disseminated without radio or television, social media, but Hannah found a way. So I obviously don't know what the picture was <laughs> that Hannah carried around, but I assume it was something like this. And you can see just like shoulder to shoulder just being packed in there. And These are bodies. Yeah, like these are all these people. And we were trying to read, like this is the women's room. And it's hard to read it. This is the men's So I mean, terrible, just terrible. Um, she even let a boycott it's, um, as early as 1788. Hannah Moore had encouraged women to, quote, taboo the use of West Indian sugar in your tea. Since women purchased the household goods, they were encouraged to boycott slave-produced sugar from the West Indies and instead go for East Indies sugar that was grown by free labor. Hannah Moore wrote a poem in 1788 called Slavery which was part of a multifaceted campaign that included preachers, poets, and parliamentarians, and it opened people's eyes to what was going on regarding the slave trade and gave people empathy. So I thought I would read a little bit of the poem to you. Not a lot, but just a little, because it's good. Here it is. Shall Britain, where the soul of freedom reigns, forge chains for others for self-disdain? Forbid it heaven, O let the nations know, the liberty she tastes she will bestow, not to herself, the glorious gift confined, she spreads the blessing wide as humankind, and scorning narrow views of time and place, bids all be free in Earth's extended space. And I printed it out if you'd like a copy of the poem. It's in that little basket and it's eight pages long. It's a really long poem. So the abolitionists succeeded in building social and political pressure against the slave trade until the French Revolution, which turned the nation's attention away from slavery. Hannah continued to write poems about <coughs> slavery and her abolition efforts were said to constitute one of the earliest propaganda campaigns for social, for social reform in English history. About 15 years after William Wilberforce introduced anti-slavery resolutions, on July 26, 1833, the Emancipation Bill passed in the House of Commons, stating all slaves were to be freed within one year. And one month later, the House of Lords passed the Slavery Abolition Act. That was in 1833, 15 years later. Yeah, it was a long, long fight. For many, this is interesting. For many years, the Church Missionary Society had a policy of naming orphaned African girls after Hannah Moore in honor of her work to abolish slavery. Isn't that fascinating? Um, Hannah Moore was the single most influential woman in the British abolitionist movement, even though women's roles were severely limited. But being a playwright, a teacher, and an abolitionist is not all Hannah Moore was known for. She was also a school founder. She and her sister, Patty, attempted to take Christian doctrine to unreached and uncivilized areas outside of Cowslip Green, where the poverty was debilitating. They wanted to open Sunday schools. These schools were held on Sundays because the families, including the children, worked six days a week. In one village, the villagers called Little Hell, Patty said, no one could read, but alas, everyone could and did swear. <laughs> in another village, the clergyman was reported to be in a state of intoxication six times a week and often had black eyes from fighting. So, in want of a good <laughs> pastor, I think. Um, the rich and poor alike were leery of the Moors wanting to open Sunday schools for these poor children. Many thought teaching the poor to read would be a disservice. One great lady even went so far as to bribe the students not to attend, 
by offering a glass of gin to anyone each day they didn't go, which I thought would be very tempting. <laughs> I'm a big, I like gin. <laughs> Hannah and Patty finally got enough support and had basically a blank check from William Wilberforce as financial backing. They found a schoolhouse and took a seven year lease in Cheddar. This, Steve found this picture from the 1900s, but that's her schoolhouse. That was the first one in Cheddar. Um, I found a drawing, but this is <laughs> better. <laughs> um, so they found a teacher for the schoolhouse. Her name was Miss Faber, and she had the true spirit of a missionary. She was so beloved by the village that when she died, the church could not hold all who came to her funeral. The Cheddar Schoolhouse right there, it grew from 140 students to 300. So the Moors opened another school. By 1796, these Sunday schools had 1,700 students in 10 parishes. Hannah worked with Sunday schools for 30 years. Her will stated that the schools should close six months after her death, which was in 1833. But some of the more successful schools became the first national schools which I thought was interesting. But Hannah Moore isn't done yet. The next group that needed reform was the upper class. Even theologian John Wesley sent a letter to Hannah Moore's sister saying, tell her to live in the world. There is the sphere of her usefulness. They will not let us come nigh them. So in 1788, Moore published the book, Thoughts on the Importance of the Manners of the Great to General Society. It's a long title. Because of her wit and brilliance, this book had impressive sales and claimed to be the most widely read book of the day. By manners, Moore was talking more than politeness and table etiquette, she meant morality. Then in 1791, she decided to dig beneath the surface of manners to religious faith in her books, thoughts with an estimate of the religion of the fashionable world. Hannah was quite the apologist. Um, to the upper class, she used her wits and her talents in her writing and she was able to defend her faith to the upper class and they loved it. Um, now in these days, what was more popular than books were street literature that were political or entertaining. Most were crude, lacking morals and religion. So between the years of 1795 and 1798, Hannah Moore wrote wholesome tracts called the Cheap Repository Tracts and they were written for the newly literate. Uh, they had eye-catching illustrations, if you can see the eye-catching illustrations, <laughs> and um, attention-grabbing titles such as Sinful Sally, The Gin Shop, Tawny Rachel, and A History of Diligent Dick. So, um, you can find them all. Like, they have them, which is interesting. They were all saved, and um, that's what they used to pass out on the streets, which I thought was kind of interesting. The cheap repository tract sales were unprecedented. Two million were circulated in less than a year. Most critics say that Hannah Moore's tracts were her most significant and skilled literary accomplishment. Now with the innovation of circulating libraries, increased literacy, and more leisure time, novel reading was on the rise, but they were not considered polite letters. So for me, it's hard to imagine a life when novels weren't in the culture. I read all of the time and I talk about books all of the time. Um, but at this time, novels as a literary form were still developing. They were not the respected art form it is today. Hannah Moore had a polite disdain for novels until 1807 when she read the novel Corinne by Madame de Stael and she was unable to resist it and could no longer deny the power a novel had over the imagination. Her first and only novel, Caleb's In Search of a Wife, debuted in 1808, but she wrote it anonymously, and it was a hit. If you can imagine, it centered around influence of education and religion on character and conduct. Seems to be her theme of writing. Um, before the next edition could even be put to the press, the first edition was out of print. It was one of England's earliest bestsellers. During Moore's last years in publications, she strictly wrote devotionals. Jane Austen is my very favorite author. Um, she wrote Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Emma, and I even named my cat after one of her characters, Mr. Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true>. um, <laughs> she was Hannah Moore's contemporary, and she wrote in a letter that some of her acquaintances were reading Hannah Moore's most recent work, Practical Piety with Delight. So Moore's last decade of life, she survived all of her siblings and friends, but for William Wilberforce. In 1831, Wilberforce came to see her and they had a lively visit. 
in 1832, he called, and she did not recognize him at first. And his passing in 1833 didn't seem to register to Hannah. Her health took a sharp turn, and she died at the age of 88. She was buried next to all her sisters, and there's a headstone there that reads, These all died in faith. And that is the fascinating story of Hannah Moore, playwright, abolitionist, school founder, and author. I love diving into the story of Hannah Moore, the life of her. I admire her so much, her empathy for others, speaking up for the downtrodden, and no matter what her sphere of influence, she shared God's love and his truth. So I asked myself, how is Hannah Moore's story relevant today? We as a culture, we want to um, rewrite or erase history. Statues are being torn down. Textbooks are being revised. We as a culture are trying to suppress people because they are a certain race or sex, a certain socioeconomic status. And I think this is so dangerous. The fact of the matter is that God uses people like Hannah Moore and William Wilberforce to make a difference, to help change a culture and abolish slavery. So no matter our, our race, our sex, our socioeconomic status, you better believe that God can use us to make a difference right where we are. So even if culture tells us we need to step down, be quiet, that we couldn't possibly understand that God is bigger and he can use us for his glory. And that is the story of Hannah Moore. <laughs> Do you have any questions? But I can maybe ask. Was the practical piety, was that by Austin or by um, Hannah? That was by Hannah. Okay. Yeah. By Hannah. I just like that Austin read her not or her devotionals. I thought that was so cool. You know if that was still in print? Do you have any idea? I don't know. No, I did read, though, that her novel, because I'm like, oh, I'm going to read it, The Caleb's In Search of a Wife. They said it was it, it would not even read like a book because it was the first of its kind. It was so, it just doesn't even read like a novel. So, um, which I find so interesting because I didn't do the research of when, like, Pride and Prejudice was written, but that obviously reads like a novel. So I don't know the timeline there, but I thought that was interesting. So, any other questions? <laughs> Did you, uh, could you tell us about <clears throat> Hannah's, um, listen, I'm not a PGC, you're going to get all my questions. <laughs> uh, could you tell us about uh, her own faith a little bit? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, was, she, was, she, um, was she a Methodist? So her dad was very big in the Church of England. Okay. And he was also, um, they like had their feet in both worlds. Okay. And so she grew up kind of seeing both sides. So where some people were like, you got to do the Church of England or nothing. Her dad was like, I mean, there's good things over here too. So she was kind of in both. Mm -hmm. But her faith didn't really come to life until she met with John Newton. And he encouraged her to dive in more and help the poor and share her faith, kind of. Okay. But she did raise, was raised in a Christian home. and Maybe because I, I mean maybe because it was so much work that I don't I don't know. What a good question. I don't know, but that was in her will. The Sunday school was to teach children to read, not about Christian faith, mostly or a little bit around them. Yeah, you know, um, Nora in Sunday school came home with the paper, and the back was about this guy in England who invented Sunday schools. And I'm like, no, Hannah Moore didn't. No. <laughs> <She did. laughs> um, <laughs> but it was created to be a school on Sundays because the kids were working ridiculous hours six days a week and they really um, didn't know how to read or write. They you know, had no time to be educated, so they made these Sunday schools. Mm -hmm. I think, I, think the, uh, I could be wrong here. I think it's Henry and Amir from the United States on the West Coast who actually turned it into, for us, oh. we got to call Sunday school, which we would call it, which is the learning of um, marching to scriptures, yeah, Christian education. So that's Henry and Amir's, that was in the, 40s and 50s. So there was not that all schools in that in that day had some sort of religious education. Right. It was just commonplace. Yeah. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would she hold the school the schools in churches or in the schools of the day? No, she made um, schoolhouses. Was that chatter. Yeah. Right. But I mean, they had many other facilities where they just 
building brand new homes? I think so. I think they just built them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they took a lease. I don't know what they would be, what they were when they took a lease they from it. Before. Yeah. Right, that's a good question. I don't know what they were before they turned it into a schoolhouse. That's so a good question. Own buildings right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like they're a lot of money since uh -huh. Silver Force funded a lot. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy that she could, you know, do so much with her literary career because of that 200 pound annuity. It's so strange that he would do that, but there you go. What's interesting is when um, Rebecca was telling us about the women last week, and they were in 1500s, mm -hmm. in 1500s, you could barely exist without being married. <laughs> right. and, and so she was really paving the way, and of course she's quite a bit later, but um, right. still kind of standing along as a person that is a woman, a non-married woman. Right. Right. Yeah. And Jane Austen never married either. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very interesting in that time. You're right. So it was just so important to get married. And she's like, no. To, to survive. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And none of her sisters did. I thought that was so crazy. I would love to know how they were raised. Like, yeah. isn't that interesting? A strong mother. Yeah. Watching Pride and Prejudice and knowing how strong that motherly influence was about getting married. Right, exactly. Yeah, that, that's literally what the whole book is about, <laughs> getting married. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Without, without marriage, they wouldn't have any funding. They right, they'd be destitute. Money. And then the women that taught Antoine Sunday mornings, and the children would go on to the Cocoon Church, because everybody, I'm wondering about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> tell me, um, as a Christian who uh, is shaped by the Lord, and, and then you read a story about Hannah Moore, and you yourself are a mom, mm -hmm. a wife, mm -hmm. you work, are you still work? Are you guys back at the courts? So you're still working from home. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, like, what what does that do to you, and how does that shape the way you live? Like, or how mm -hmm. has it begun to shape the way? You live? In other words. If biography is to shape us and right. become different, mm -hmm. part of the reason it reads is because it actually has an influence on our life from the name of Christ. And right. so how does it begin to, to shape your own life? Yeah. That's a big question. It is. Life. Yeah. But you can give us like many, many, maybe a couple different mm -hmm. things. I know throughout the last year, what I have been praying to be more is bold and stand up for what I believe in. So it's so easy to be like, yeah, I see where you're coming from, and then say nothing else. Right. And so I think working on that myself and then learning about Hannah Moore and how she just was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to open a schoolhouse and, you know, just teach the, the, um, the poor. And then I'm going to teach the upper class. She just unabashedly did everything. You know, I found that to be very inspiring and to just don't hold back and say what you want to say um, and defend your faith, you know, even if people don't like it. So I think that's what I learned most from her. Thought about that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It would be hard. It, it would be hard to be like I don't know how realistic it was in the um, Amazing Grace movie. There's a whole table of men, and then Hannah Moore was there. You know, as the only lady like speaking up. I think it would be really hard to be the one to speak up, where everyone else is saying like, no, no, this isn't our place. You know. So again, I think that goes back to boldness, just standing up for what you believe in, even if people are like, but you're a woman, you know, so. Yeah, and even now we're like Christians and like that one person with a table full of other people. Mm-hmm, right. And, you know, that are pushing against culture. And how easy it is to say nothing. Yep. Just like. Well, when that person um, accused her of plagiarism um, in her playwriting, mm -hmm. um, she probably had no defense. You know, probably no opportunity to defend yourself. Just, right. Uh, just slump away, away, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Completely out of that business now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you see the support of like the John Allen, the William Wilberforce, John Wesley. You know, that's that's really cool to see that. I know. Support. Yeah, and that he saw. All of us to see that. Like you think, like we're in Lakewood Ranch, right? In that, what uh, John Wesley said. God can use you where you are, like use your sphere of influence. You're in, you know, the upper class of London talking to them and they, they like what you're doing. So keep it up. You know, you're like, oh, I should go talk to 
popsicle or you know, I mean, you can be used wherever you are. So right. even here in the cooker. The up and out. The up and out. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, for many of us, that's that is the call. Right. And so Hannah Moore's inspiring it. Mm -hmm. That um, oftentimes we all say, "Well, geez, we live in you know nice church, and we live. Well, how can we go and just help this group?" But actually, God's placed us in a group to maybe influence more. Right. For His sake, in a, in a different sphere where we do have power. Right. And use our voice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how um, anti-culture it was for John Wesley to be that straightforward and bold with her. Right. Also, you know, recognizing I mean that what you, you shared with us is almost as though that he really did way before the time have her on an equal right equal basis. It reminds me of your women where their husbands had their had her had their wives' backs, they listened to them, you know, and it seems like Wesley, too, he was... Yeah. Waged by a very strong mom, Wesley was. She was also in the Seven Women yeah. books, Susanna Wesley. Yeah. Yep. Right. yep. Mm -hmm. <coughs> she would sit in her chair in her kitchen with an apron over her head for peace and quiet. Because <laughs> 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 I remember about her. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she had so many. I was thinking how that meant would be about. Yeah, and John Wesley was gone a lot. He he went to go for free, right? He would go preach sermons and like not get paid for it and just be gone. And she's like raising these children and stuff. Yeah, the house burned down. And yeah, that's right. And there was a ghost. There was a ghost in the house. Yeah, that's a crazy story. <laughs> and they had a travel preacher preach and don't like them, so they came to hear her. Yeah, that's right. She's like, I got something to say. So he spoke. <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah. Well, that's from Seven Women mm -hmm. from the Eric Natasha. So, yep. also another plug for that. Mm -hmm. well, and be sure to um, grab the poem. It's a it's a really fascinating read. She was very powerful with her uh, with her words. Mm -hmm. so. By the way, Tractable Piety looks like it's available on Kindle for ninety nine cents. Wow. Yeah. Really? Oh, <laughs> nice. All right, that'll be our next book club. We'll go through practical piety together. <laughs> well, before we close, any other comments or encouragements? Great work. Yeah. <laughs> and so we thought it'd be fun to close with Amazing Grace. Oh, nice. That's thematic. So. Not, not the new version. Not the new version. <laughs> the new version. <laughs> this one's probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> So you can sit if you want or stand, it's a little long, so it's up to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How sweet
soften that. Uh, well, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming and sharing with us and hope that we can, you know, really think about this and take what we've learned from here, that God would use it in our lives and shape us to be more like him and a light to those around us. Um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the people that you grow up to reflect to you, to a culture, to a world, to a people. Lord, I pray that you would raise up those of us in this room who are following you, that you would raise us up to, Lord, in our local spheres of influence um, to shape culture and hearts for you, that people would see your light in us, Lord, and that many would be called out of darkness. I pray you would use Cornerstone. I thank you for the weekly people that you bring in. They're just scratching the surface of who you are. Lord, I pray you continue to use Cornerstone as a light in our community. In your name, amen. Thanks, everyone.